Okay, let's go ahead and get ourselves started again. For the second part of class today, what we want to talk about is cost estimating and how we can use models to help us with our cost estimating. And as we get going on the whole issue of cost estimating, it's sort of important to kind of put it all into perspective and understand really what the models are good for and what the models aren't good for. Because there's definitely you know, a division in there. Yeah. What the models tend to be very good for, or really what estimating consists of, is this whole notion of it almost always starts where we try to come up with some sort of quantities that describe the building we're trying to build. Okay. And it turns out of all the things that the models are good for, they're very good at that. It turns out that as you go through and do your estimating, estimating the quantities could actually be one of the hardest parts. It's one of the most error prone parts of the whole process because if you've ever been given a stack of documents, oh, here are 100 documents that describe some building, trying to go through and manually take it all off by measuring or having some little electronic instrument that's going to help you measure the lengths of the areas and making sure you don't transcribe something wrong and making sure that although you took it out off on sheet 10, that you didn't take it off again on sheet 11, but there's something that looks like it on sheet 12, but I'm not quite sure if it's the same thing or not. You know, that tends to be a very error prone process. And I'll, most of the big mistakes that are made in terms of estimating, it all happens on the quantity side. That's where th the errors happen. So modeling is very, very good for helping us take off accurate quantities because in the model there is one element there. And if we can take it off from the model, it's not going to lie to you about whether or not it's there. Now, that puts a lot of burden on the modeler in terms of making sure that everything that you want to take off is in the model because you're not going to get any quantities that weren't actually put into the model. But if you get an accurate model, you will tend to get accurate quantities. So this is all, you know, it's kind of about accuracy. And the modeling is definitely going to be great for helping you with that. An estimate is a lot more than just getting accurate quantities, though. We have this whole issue of given that we have quantities, what sort of pricing or what sort of costs we want to associate with all those different elements. And this is something that that's not going to help you with at all. Yeah, that, there's a lot of different sources we can use for getting pricing information. The best source of information is historical data. So if you have some experience doing a certain type of work, you'll know based on your own experience doing that type of work how much doing certain types of operations cost. And that's definitely the best way to get information is based on history. And that history, the more it's very, very local to my process and my company and my people and all those special things, the better your pricing is going to be. <laughs> okay. But if we don't have access to history, and here in school we tend not to have access to a whole lot of history based on all the projects we've completed, we tend to use things like source books, which are just historical databases where companies basically aggregate a lot of cost data across all these different projects across the US or across the world, pull it all together, and they sell you that data. They sell you all that historical data. So source books are actually very, very good for getting started. There's always sort of the caveat with source books where it's not really your data. And since it's normalized across a lot of regions, we have to go ahead and normalize it for, I'll call it region or location. We have to sort of normalize it for time. There's a lot of things we have to sort of do to adjust the factors, but we can factor things and actually come up with some pretty reasonable data. Okay. Another thing that the model-based estimating is not going to take into account is the whole issue of strategy. Because even beyond your raw costs, okay, there's this whole issue of how much you want this job and how unique your process is. And yeah, just there's a whole level of strategy that goes into the business of winning jobs and competing on jobs and letting some jobs go. And it's not going to help you with that either. That's really that's a business decision that's up to you. But at least we can go ahead and take care of this variability and take that out of the equation. And that's really what we're going to focus on right now. Okay. Now, as we work through the different types of estimates, it's important to know that we can do some estimating at every level of the project. Even at the earliest conceptual stages, we can come up with some sort of notion of how expensive that project is going to be. So even very early on, if you come to me today and say that, hey, I want to build a house in Palo Alto, okay, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that will at least give me a pretty good idea of how much it's likely to you know, cost so I can give you some preliminary feedback. I'll ask you, okay, first you told me it was going to be in Palo Alto. Okay, that's going to be very important. Second, I'm going to ask you, well, how big is it? Okay, so, oh, it's going to be 3,000 square foot. Okay, so great. 
based on sort of what I know about building things in Palo Alto, oh, if houses in Palo Alto average around $300 a square foot or something like that, I can say, knowing more, no other information, it's going to be a $900,000 house to build. Okay. Now, if you told me you were going to build it in Kansas City, I'd say, oh, that's going to be a $150,000 house to build. Okay, because there really is that big of a competitive difference based on locales and things like that. But based on some very preliminary data, I can try to figure out, you know, it's where it is, what the use of the building is going to be. I might even go ahead and uh, ask you a little about the quality level. So it's going to be the location, actually. It's going to be the use. It's going to be the location. It's going to be the size. And it's going to be some notion of quality. Because even when we're talking about the houses, you know, there's a Home Depot version of the house where it's all the builder basics, okay? And there's the Palo Alto, every surface is granite and stainless steel and glass version of the house. And I have different metrics I use depending on where you're going to tell me you're coming on that. And everyone, everyone promises they're building a Home Depot house, but then when it comes time to choose finishes, they go for the granite countertops. That's just sort of a truism. <laughs> People never like uh, act rationally relative to what they say their budget is. But based on that preliminary data, we can actually come up with some really rough estimate of what the uh, cost is going to be, even at a very conceptual stage. You know, I haven't even put a wall down yet, and I have a pretty good idea of how much your house is going to cost. So if you tell me it's a house versus a school versus a church versus a commercial building, I'll have different sets of metrics I use, and that's enough. That's enough to get us going. Okay. As we go further, we can look at it in more detail, but all these things really just add up to being able to give a very conceptual estimate. So let's show you what that would actually look like. So I'm over here in Revit. We're hanging around in Revit right now. Let me go through and just put together a real simple little mass model. So there's no form to this at all. I'm just going to put an in-place mass down. I'm going to call it my house mass. And this is just really all about creating some sort of size. I'll put down some building, something about like that. I'll make a form out of that. Let me finish that. Oh, let me rotate it up. I'll give it a little bit of shape. So I can give it a little bit of shape, nothing too drastic for now. OK, let me finish that mass. OK, that is some volume of space. Hopefully, that's about the volume that I wanted. But what I can do is take that. And my second step is divided into mass floors. Mass floors really just subdivided into different levels so I could actually report out the square footages. So I have two mass floors there, the lowest level and the second level. And even at this point, I can construct a schedule that tells me what the square footages are and start applying costs to that. So let's take a look at what that looks like. I can come back over to the View tab, so that I want to create a schedule. And one of the things that we're able to schedule is mass floors. So where are they? There they are. I can say that I'd like to, oh, I'll report on every level. And I'll report on the floor area. I can put in the perimeter and the volume and some other things. But that's enough just to get me going. Let me go ahead and put a subtotal on that or a total down there at the bottom. And I'll total up those areas. OK, and we'll see how we're doing so far. Actually, not too bad. 3,300 square feet. That was pretty good for a guess. <laughs> OK, so that's the starting point. Now, what can we do? That's enough. It's getting us going with just the square footages. Let's think about actually applying some cost information to that and how we could actually use the schedule to do some computations. And how we would do that is we can go back into the schedule and open its properties. And we're going to add a new field to it. That field is actually going to be a calculated value. Okay, So for that calculated value, what I can do is say that I want to put together a formula. I'm going to call this my conceptual cost. I'll say it's going to be a number. That's fine. And it's going to be floor area times 200, or 300. I'll stick with, with the data I was using here in Palo Alto. Now, I have to do one other thing. I have to actually divide through by one square foot. What that's all about is I'm just normalizing units, because area was in square feet, and I'm kind of taking the square footage back out. 
So now for that, I'm also going to go ahead and sum that up, just so I can put a total on it. And if I want to, I could even sort of format that as a currency. That'll just kind of help me uh, push it over a little bit. Put a, let's do that. Put the comma in there. So, so far, based on that 3,300 square foot house, I'm getting a million and 14. Okay. Now, the nice thing about doing that at this level with the conceptual mass is I can go back and if that's looking like a little bit too much house, just start pushing and pulling on the shape. Then go back to the schedule and sort of see what the results are. I can very quickly make changes and get that number back out. So just let the model take care of all the estimating in the background, but just go ahead and really focus on the form and really what the cost impact is. And the directness of that feedback is really, really helpful. Now, let's think about it in a little bit more detail. I'm looking at this mass floor schedule. This mass floor schedule is all based on this magic number of 300. As I think about different uses and different types of buildings, it's quite common that I actually don't want to use the same number for all the levels of the building. For example, when I'm doing like a mixed use building, like even in our example, you know, the um, um, dollars per square foot for the office space is probably very different than the dollars per square foot for a garage or the dollars per square foot for the retail space. Because there's just different levels of fixtures and fittings, and certain spaces are really cheap to build. Like in a house, the most expensive things are the bathrooms and the kitchen, okay, where the bedrooms are actually relatively cheap per square foot. So I can start sort of subdividing and get a little bit finer. And let's think about how we could do that. I got level one and level two here. Let's assume that maybe in this little building, oh, I'll change the context and say that instead it's going to be a little office building. And maybe level two is going to be the office space at $300 a square feet. Maybe level one is going to be some other use at like $150 a square feet or $100 a square foot, just some other figure. So if we want to go ahead and add that little bit of control in, we can do that. And let me show you how. I'll say, again, go back to the view properties. And what I want to do is actually have a parameter, a parameter I can use to basically say what the use is of each of the different floors so that I can change my formula based on that parameter. Okay? So if you want to do that, it, you do something like this. I can say add a parameter. And I'll call this my building use. I'll leave it as a text field. Actually, I'm going to change it. I can use the number field right now. It's easier to compare that way. I'll make it an integer. And I'll say OK there. And I'll kind of move it up a little bit. Then how about this? Let's take our conceptual cost, and we'll change that formula around a little bit. If the conceptual cost is equal to 1, let's use one figure. If the conceptual of the building use is 2, let's use a different figure. So let's go ahead and change that formula around to reflect that. So if building use is 1, it's one thing. If it's building use is 2, it's a different categorization. So I can edit that formula. And there really is a whole little formula language that's at work in here. But you can say things, and you know, we can look it up in the help system to kind of figure out all the different variations. But it looks something like this. If building use is equal to 1, we'll do floor area times 300. And then if not, I'll paste the same formula and say that it's 100. And what that's that all about? That is really, it's very much like working with Excel. It's sort of if, and then the positive condition, and the negative condition. Let me say OK to those things. We'll put that in place. So right now it's a bunch of 0, because there's nothing entered there yet. But if I would go ahead and put in there 1, it's going to multiply it by 300. If I would put in anything other than 1, like 2, it's going to multiply it by 100. So I can start building up little conditional formulas that'll let me then, if I'm looking at a whole office tower, kind of uh, just change the use and real quickly still get this uh, conceptual data back out. So at a real high level, that's what I want to leave you with about conceptual estimating. At a real high level, just go through, let the quantities that are coming out of this sort of drive, and you can construct these simple schedules that'll go through and you know, hopefully give you something useful. Okay. So that's enough on conceptual estimating. Let's go ahead and move into more of a preliminary estimate, which is really more of what you have in mind for the assignment. When we move to the preliminary estimate type, 
What we tend to do is actually stop just thinking about the overall square footage and we think about there are some quantities of building elements that really drive the cost more than others. And specifically, for your preliminary estimate, we're asking you to look at the walls, the glazing, the roof, and even the structural steel. So let's think about each of those. So walls, roof, glazing, and steel. Now, each of those different types of assemblies has a way that sort of typically drives the cost. For a lot of things, things are driven by square footage cost. When we think about the cost of building a wall, we tend to think about it as a dollars per square foot of building that wall. You could also do it per linear foot based on a certain height of the wall, but it's about the same thing. Roof, often we think of in terms of square feet. Even glazing, we often sort of estimate by square footage of glazing. Steel is a little bit different. We tend to actually estimate steel by the weight, so by the pounds of steel, something like that. But we can kind of come up with sort of formulas that sort of drive us towards all these different metrics. So what I really want to do is just figure out how many square feet of wall, how many square feet of roof. I still have to come up with some cost pricing information, okay? but we'll start out with that. So to illustrate this, let me go pop it on over to a different model. I'll go back to that simple little house model, the one we were looking at from an energy standpoint. And over here, let's just think about oh, how we'd, for example, compute the quantity of the walls. So you already did this a little bit as part of assignment two, where there was a room or the wall schedule and a roof schedule and things like that. If I create a schedule of, for example, the walls, I'll put the area in there. I'll also put the family and type in there. I like to sort of be able to see which ones I'm talking about. Let me go ahead and say OK to that. You'll see that I have all the basic wall surfaces as well as the curtain walls. So what might I want to do to this? Maybe I should uh, put some subtotaling in here. So I subtotal based on uh, these, the type, and I have a separate subtotal for that. Just got to break that up a little bit. What would that look like? That'll look like, oh, under sorting, let me sort by family and type. I'll put a footer under there and put a blank line in, then I'll put a grand total at the bottom. Finally, I'll just sum those all up, which looks something like this. So about 3,000 square feet of this wall, 400 square feet of that wall. So, so far, we're, we're getting there. We're getting closer. Okay. We still would like to go ahead and have some way of incorporating that cost information in there. And the nice thing about these wall types and most of the different building element types is there's actually a field available called cost that you can use for doing this type of estimating. And I haven't shown it yet, but it is there. It's just waiting to be used. It is right over there. So I can put in, I'll, that's the unit cost. So if I wanted to now go through and actually have a preliminary cost, which is multiplying the area times the cost, I can add that as a formula. So I'll again say, oh, I'll call this the preliminary cost. And that'll just be area times cost, again, divided by 1 over square foot. <coughs> say OK to that. So let's think about how this works. I got the cost field. The cost field is actually a type parameter. So if I put a cost in, it'll actually apply to all the walls of the same type. I could set up a separate field with an instance parameter, but this is actually something that does make more sense to do as a type parameter. So if that wall is going to be, say, oh, 2250 per square foot to build, it'll give me all the costs. If the curtain wall is, say, $35 a square foot, It'll give me that. And what am I missing? I should probably go through and just put some subtotals in there. Let me go back and put a subtotal under the cost. And I can even format that again. Let me format it as currency, just so it looks a little bit better. Put some digits in there, or put the commas in. Okay. So even for this little building now, in a really preliminary sort of way, I can start to summarize the walls, I can start to summarize the roofs. 
The glazing, I've actually taken care of the storefront. It came in through as, as a type of wall. I'd still have to do the windows in terms of sort of figuring out what's going on there. And even things like summarizing the steel are possible here. So for example, we can go through and if I go back to view, schedule. If you actually schedule all the structural framing elements, you'll see that one of the values that's available in here is the volume. And the volume is really what you can ultimately drive to figure out what the weight of the steel is. Because if you have the volume, you could actually kind of use the density to figure that out. Now, there's another type of schedule in here I should tell you about, too, that might be useful for you. It's called a materials takeoff. A materials takeoff is really all about, as opposed to going through and just doing it on an element by element basis, aggregating all the different elements that use a single material together into a single number. So I could say that I want to get all the gypsum wallboard off of any of the different elements and come up with the total number of square feet of gypsum wallboard, okay, and add it up that way, or do it with all the steel. That's just another way to get at it. Now, this is all kind of really cool from the standpoint of being able to get the quantities out. It still may leaves you with the whole notion of having to go through and make sure you create all the right schedules to tabulate up what you need to tabulate up. And you still have to come up with the costs. And again, we're going to talk about that in just a second. But if you have some costs, it's pretty easy to plug in. And the model's doing what it's good for. And then you have to kind of do you know, the expertise to kind of apply that in another way. Let's go ahead. Tejo, you want to talk about the RS mean stuff now before I do quantity takeoff? Can you do it in about 10 minutes? Can you try that? Yeah. Let's see if we can swap you in there, because you know I think that's more important at the first part than going right into quantity takeoff. But leave me about oh, 10 at the end. 